go. Um, we're going to finish up our 11.6 work um, with some fun with factorials and then our long-awaited proof of the ratio test. But first, let's recall at the end of class last time, we said that for n large, where n goes to infinity, we had this kind of dominance. That's the double, um, you know, greater than signs. Um, I think in that last video, I wrote greater than or equal to for the very last one with as a typo. It really should be this guy, right? And we sort of, we established a variety of these guys and where they came from and how we use series um, in order to determine limits that allowed us to kind of have an understanding of how fast something grows as n grows unbounded. Um, so logarithms are dominated by power functions, which are dominated by exponential functions, which are dominated by factorials, which are dominated by this guy. The, the, the fastest growing of them, of these all. So um, with that in mind, now we're gonna take a little bit more look at factorials. So what's your guess? Um, ignore the phone call. Um, what's your guess? We're gonna look at number 21. Um, the way number 21 is stated is it's written, it's not written out this way, it's written out in terms of the first several terms. So they give you the first several terms that, and then they give you basically a n sitting way out there, right? So you can compare 11.6 number 21. Um, this is our guy, okay? Um, when n is one, right, this is positive, one factorial. And then what does this mean here? It means I start multiplying Basically, what is this saying? I'm multiplying the odd numbers together, right? And then I'm gonna end at, um, at this value. So when n is one, two times n is two minus one is one. So the last number I'm gonna multiply together is one. When n is two, two times two, four minus one is three. So the last number I'm gonna multiply odd numbers is one times three. That's why it's this guy. When n is three, I got five out of here, so it's one times three times five. What will the next one denominator be? Good, one times three times five times seven, right? Okay, so that's the way that guy is working, and um, here we'll just write it as a series, and so let's just work on this problem, okay? So what is, what should we do? Again, screaming ratio test. Um, so I'm gonna do the ratio test, limit and then goes to infinity of the absolute value of the next term divided by the previous term, right? Um, the, the sign change is coming from here, right? So I've got negative, some negative terms, some positive terms, but the beautiful thing is that absolute value, that piece is just one, and so we can ignore it. We don't bring it in here. We know that we're going to get rid of that for the absolute value. And so when I write down my um, thing that I'm going to take the limit of, everything else is positive. So I can ignore the absolute, I can ignore that guy, ignore the absolute values, and then just write down what my terms are. So what is a sub n plus one? I only really care about this piece, right? It's going to be n plus one factorial divided by what? Well, it's going to be one times three times five, right? You're adding, you're multiplying together all these odd numbers. And what is the last one you're going to do? Well, I'm going to, same thing. If I'm looking at what is a sub n plus one, I'm going to put an n plus one where there was an n. So we're going to do that. Two times n plus one minus one. That's my final term, right? Okay. Now that's just a sub n plus one. Now I need to divide by a sub n. We're getting better at this now, so I'm gonna just write it over here just so that you kind of see it. If I'm gonna divide by a sub n, the absolute value, then that n factorial is gonna end up down here, and that guy's gonna be positive when we put it in absolute value, and the other piece is gonna come up here. One times three times five times out to two times n minus one. Right? Okay. So now how do we look at this thing? Well, we want to um, write down, simplify what this is. We're pretty good with n, fact, n plus one factorial now, right? So we're gonna rewrite n plus one factorial how? n plus one times n factorial, and then we have all of that, times one times three, <laughs> not two, times three times five, the whole way out to two times n minus one. That's what's in the numerator. What's in the denominator? Okay, so, now, let's think about this guy. What is this? This is two times n plus two distribute minus one. 
what is that? 2 times n plus 2 minus 1 is plus 1, right? Okay, and so what do we have in the denominator? 1 times 3 times 5 times a whole bunch of other odd numbers, right? And the very last one is going to be 2 times n plus 1. Yeah, okay, very nice. And then what do we have left? We have this n factorial, right? Down here in the denominator times that, yeah? And so let's start thinking about what's going to cancel, okay? Um, let's think about what's going to cancel. Well, I've got my nice n factorials there, so they cancel, yeah? Ones cancel. 3 over 3, 5 over 5, right? Life is looking pretty good here, yeah? Okay? All right, now what about like this thing, yeah? So we've got to be a little bit careful here, right? Here, what does this mean? I'm multiplying all odd numbers together. 1 times 3 times 5 times 7, the whole way up to 2 times n plus 1. Well, what is the odd number that comes before 2 times n plus 1? What comes before that? Well, what comes before 5? 3. What comes before 3? 1. It's a number, that's a number that is 2 less than that. So what is a number 2 less than 2n plus 1? 2n plus 1 minus 2, which is 2n minus 1, right? That's 2 less than n plus 1, right? So don't forget, that guy is there. So, we're not left with this piece still up here, right? Because that's going to get canceled by the previous guy that came before here. Yeah? Right? Make sense? Okay. So now what are we left with? We're left simply with the limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 1 divided by 2n plus 1. That's all that's left. That's infinity over infinity. You could do L'Hopital's rule if you want, or we could just divide top and bottom by n, the highest power of n in the denominator. Or, uh, yeah, and, and so what we, we get there, if we divide everything by n, we get 1 plus 1 over n over 2 plus 1 over n, right? Dividing every term by n. And then we have our favorite limit. Limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n. Where does that go? Zero. We're so good at this, right? One over something getting huge. So what is this limit reduced to? One plus zero over two plus zero, one half. Hey, what do we care about? <gasps> it's a ratio test, right? This guy's our L. What do we want L to be? Less than one, and then we have what? Therefore, this series converges. How? Good, absolutely. Again, what does that mean, right? We're saying that this guy is absolutely convergent. What does that mean? If I change all these negatives to positives, that series will converge, and therefore the series where we're subtracting stuff obviously converges because we proved that in one of the other videos, right? Absolute convergence implies convergence, right? Absolute convergence means if we change the positives to ne the negatives to positives, that different series will converge, and then um, the bigger series converging gave you that this smaller series with the negatives also converges. They converge to different things. We're not asking what they converge to. Um, we're just asking that they converge. And so a lot of times and as we move forward, we might see weird things like this. And so um, understanding how to deal with them, because um, that you might be surprised, but actually comes up in, you know, normally in problems. Make sense? Okay. So we have this nice result there. Um, let's do one more fun, fun factorial problem and then we'll move along to our um, proof. Looking for my good black marker. I don't see it. That's not good. I hope this one's not the good one. What did I do with it? equals 1 to infinity of 2n factorial, the parentheses matter, uh, divided by n factorial squared. 
Okay. Well, this couldn't scream ratio test any louder, right? There's not even nth power in there for root test. Anyway, lots of factorials. Okay, so I want you to just take a guess. What do you think? Who's going to grow faster? Just take a guess, your guess. What do you think? 2n factorial or n factorial squared, right? Okay, 2n factorial or n factorial squared. Guess, what do you think? Is this convert or diverge? I don't know. It's hard to say, right? Okay. Um, so let's um, explore with ratio test. We're going to be looking at the limit as n goes to infinity, the absolute value, right, of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n. But now, remember, um, these guys are all positive, so absolute value isn't going to be an issue for us. Let's come down here for a sec and just make sure that we understand um, a couple of these things, right? So what does n factorial squared mean? It means n factorial times factorial, right? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, well, I'll come down here again in a sec. So let's look at this. We've got the limit as n goes to infinity. a sub n plus 1 means put an n plus 1 everywhere you saw an n, right? We're going to lose the absolute values because we know everything is positive. So what am I going to do um, in the numerator? Right, my a sub n plus 1 is going to be 2 times the quantity n plus 1. Now here's your parentheses really, really matter. Right, I'm putting an n plus 1 everywhere I saw an n, and now I've got a factorial out here. Yeah? Divided by a sub, or sorry, a sub n plus 1, I need to replace this guy, right, which is n plus 1 quantity factorial quantity squared, right? I put n plus 1 factorial. I replaced n with n plus 1. Yes? This is a sub n plus 1. We good? All right. Now we have to divide by a n. Well, dividing by a n, right, means multiplying by the reciprocal. Yeah? So what's going to be up here in the numerator? We're just avoiding having to do that big fraction. We're doing two steps at once. Good. n factorial squared. And then down here? Good. 2n factorial. Okay? Good. Okay. So, let me ask you this. Here's a question. Do we need those parentheses? Is 2n factorial equal to 2 times n factorial? No, that is totally, totally false, right? Yeah, totally false, right? Okay, can't say that. Okay, so those parentheses matter, right? 2n factorial means this. 2n factorial means parentheses. All right. Well, this is a popular house today. Lots of phone calls. Uh, sorry. Anyway, let's just keep going. Now let's see how we're going to break this thing down, okay? So what do we got? Um, let's ignore these guys for right now. Um, well, let's just do a little bit. So what can we do here? We can at least multiply in here, right? We can multiply that. So what is that inside those parentheses? 2n plus 2 factorial. Oh my gosh, I can throw the phone. Okay. Um, 2n plus 2 factorial, yes? Okay. In parentheses. Times, what's up here? 2n factorials, right? An n factorial times an n factorial. n factorial times n factorial, right? Multiply times each other. Okay. What about down here? Well, I've got an n plus 1 factorial times an n plus 1 factorial. That's what that means, right? That squared. And then times a 2n factorial. We already talked about why we need parentheses. Yes? Good. Okay. So now what? Let's keep, oh, we forgot the word, we forgot the limit. All right. That just keeps coming along for the ride. We haven't done anything yet. Okay, so now we have to break out our factorials. The limit and then goes to infinity. Let's do denominator first. Because we're good at n plus 1 factorial. n plus 1 
kind and kind of girl, you got this. You probably already wrote it all down. Yeah, right? You're ahead of me. Um, times quantity 2n factorial. Yeah? Now up there, we have those 2n factorials multiplied times each other there. So this guy is the only guy we now need to figure out. Right? What does thing factorial mean? Right? So let's think about this. So 2n plus 2 factorial means I take this thing that's my first whatever showing up here, which is 2n plus 2, and then I multiply times the factorial of one less than that, right? 2n plus 1 factorial. Yeah? I think you guys are on this already. But do I want to stop there? No, because what? Here's this 2n plus 2. I've got a 2n factorial. I want that to reduce even more, right? But what is 2n plus 1 factorial? Well, that is 2n plus 1, right? Times 1 less factorial. What is 1 less than 2n plus 1? 2n factorial. Yes? Makes sense? So that's what's going up here. That's what we want to, that's what makes sense to break down for our canceling. So I've got 2n plus 2 times 2n plus 1 times the quantity 2n factorial times all that stuff. Yes? Now what cancels? Right? Let's see. We got our n factorial and an n factorial. We got an n factorial and an n factorial. Yeah? We're super excited. We got a 2n factorial and a 2n factorial. That was the whole goal of that, right? And then what's left? Stuff that doesn't cancel now, right? So what do we have? We've got the limit times n goes to infinity. There's several options you could do right now, but since it's just this times this over that times that, those are easy things to just um, foil out and, um, and write as quadratics. So let's foil this guy. What do we get from the f? Good. 4n squared from the outers, 2n from the inners, 2 times 2n, 4n. So the oi, right? 6n, right? Um, and the l, the last is good, plus 2. Yeah, we good? That's our numerator foiled. Yeah. Then denominator, we should be good at this one. n squared plus 2n plus 1. Beautiful. This is limit. It's infinity over infinity. We could do Locus House rule twice. Or we could use our slick, faster method where we just divide top and bottom this time by n squared, right? Yeah, highest power in the denominator. So when I divide each term by n squared, 4n squared over n squared is 4, right? Uh, what am I going to get from dividing 6n by n squared? 6 over n. And then the last, 2 over n squared. Down the bottom, I'm going to get 1 plus 2 over n plus 1 over n squared. Yeah, life is great. What happens with, you know, we no longer have infinity over infinity. We have constant over something getting huge in each one of these cases. And what happens to constant over something getting huge in each one of these cases? They go to zero, right? So what is this limit? Four over one. What is four over one, right? Four plus zero over one plus zero. What is that? Four over one is awesome. Four. What can you tell me about four? Bigger than one, right? It's been a while since we got anything that wasn't less than one. Four over one is bigger is bigger than one. So what does this tell us? Series diverges by the ratio test. Yep, that was the conclusion, right, of the second part of the ratio test. So now we've seen an example. So did, were you, did you guess well? Did you guess right? Right? This thing diverges, right? Okay. This is diverging. That's actually growing faster than that guy. Okay. Um, okay. So now what? Um, we are. We've seen a case of. Uh, we just did an example of convergence, absolute convergence. We just did an example of divergence. Now we want to really understand why the uh, ratio test actually works. So let's prove it. Right. We've been using it nonstop. We've seen how phenomenal it is. Um, now we want to see why it works. Because it's 
pretty powerful, right? Pretty powerful. Okay, here we go. And I'm not going to write it all down again. You know what it says. Um, we have that somewhere else. So what are we doing with the ratio test, right? We're considering a sum, right? of terms, yeah? And these guys um, can be positive or negative, yeah? Okay, so let's consider that. And um, we're gonna prove part one first, okay? So, um, so we'll prove part one first. So what do we do in part one, right? Um, so we're going to let the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n be equal to L, where, what's true about L? Uh, L is greater than or equal to 0 and less than 1, right? That's what we have in, the, in uh, part 1. So what does this buy us? Right? Knowing that, by definition of limit, we've been talking about this since day one back in August, right? Um, by definition, the limit, no, January, this is spring. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> we haven't talked about since back in August, but that was Calc 1, Matthew 35. All right, so by definition of limit, um, what do we know? We know that true this is finite we're measuring how close that is to that so what do we want here good an epsilon for every epsilon greater than zero this guy's getting huge so what do we want there exists a capital n greater than zero such that what if this guy's big enough little n is bigger than capital n then what the distance between these two things can be made as small as possible right and that's the whole deal right how do we say that in math the distance between those two things, the absolute value of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n minus L is less than epsilon, right? Okay, that's what we know. Okay, so let's just see if we can make that more palatable, right? Um, okay, so um, for n greater than capital N, right, um, what else do we know? have that. Well, let's get rid of the outside absolute values there. So if we get rid of the outside absolute values, what do we know? We've got minus epsilon is less than the absolute value of an plus 1 over an minus l, right, which is less than epsilon. Yeah. And then what do we always do? We add l to all sides, right? And so L minus epsilon is less than the absolute value of an plus 1 over an, uh, which is less than L plus epsilon, right? So there's where we are. Yeah? Okay. All right, so now let's remember we are, what, we, what are we kind of doing? Let's come over here to the side for a sec. Um, this is the n-axis, right? Um, the idea is here's capital N. We're out here. N is bigger than capital N. And then, you know, you have some L, right? So say that's L, right? And then um, there's an L plus epsilon, yeah, okay? And, um, and we said L is smaller than one, and so we can always choose our epsilon so that we've got this, right? So L is less than one. And then we can always choose a number R that's between one and L plus epsilon. Very similar to the um, argument we talked about the other day. So, there exists um, R with what? Zero is less than R, which is less than one from kind of the picture there. Um, 
such that what is true, L plus epsilon is less than R, right? Yeah, okay. And so if, L, if this is smaller than L plus epsilon, if we just look at that piece right there and this guy, right, then what do we have? What law is that? Then by the, A is less than B, B is less than C, good, the transitive law, we have that. We only care really about this piece right now. The absolute value of a sub n plus 1 over a n is less than r. Make sense? Okay, we okay there? Awesome. All right. We have then. Okay. Um, and we know this is true from fraction math with absolute values, right? Yeah, so that's true. And so, I know the absolute value of an is positive because it's an absolute value, so I know I can multiply, right? And since the absolute value of an is positive, right, I can multiply across that inequality and, um, and not change the sign, direction of the inequality. Right? We okay there? All right. And this is true when? For n bigger than n, right? That's where we all started. For little n greater than capital N. As long as we're out here, right? We have this inequality. Okay, so I'm gonna erase some things now. Um, we good? We got to here. I just need some space. So, Maybe we'll just, yeah, no, I guess we'll just go ahead and erase. A little more detail than your book's proof. Just want to make sure you see where stuff's coming from. Okay, so for us, we're saying this is bigger, this is true for n greater than capital N, right? So, since this guy is a true statement for any little n greater than capital N, so for little n equal to capital N plus 1, remember this is discrete, right? So the next guy after this is n plus 1, right? The next guy after that is n plus 2, right? Where we have dots, right? Yeah? Make sense? Okay. Um, all right. So, when little n is equal to capital N plus 1, then this statement is true. So if I replace little n with capital N plus one, then what will I have? The absolute value of a sub capital N plus one plus one, so that's N plus two, is less than R times the absolute value of a sub N plus one, right? Capital N plus one, right? Okay. Now when N is N plus two, I'm going to have the exact same thing, right? So if I put an in capital N plus 2 in here, plus 1, then, then I'm going to have the absolute value of capital N plus 3, right? And that's going to be less than, you guys tell me, absolute value of A sub N plus 2, right? Yeah? That's what that is, right? That's capital N, matters. But what do we know about absolute value of A sub N plus 2? It's smaller than r times a sub n plus 1. So we can use that transitive law again, right, to say, well, but this, excuse me, this piece, right, I've got my r right there, right, and this piece is itself smaller than, so I have my less than right here, is smaller than r times the absolute value of a sub n plus 1. Now what is that? Well, that's just r squared times the absolute value of a sub n plus 1, right? Okay, well, let's keep doing this for a few more. What if I go to the next one, right? three past capital N. Well then what are we going to be able to say here? From this inequality, a sub n plus 4, right, is smaller than r times the absolute value of a sub n plus 3, yeah? 
And that's less than, okay, well what? Here's this R, right? That R, I mean, that R is just that R, but this quantity is smaller than R squared times that. So that piece gives me this less than times smaller than R squared times that, right? Which is just R cubed times the absolute value of A sub n plus one. Are we getting this? Yeah, okay. Now note, right? This guy, the absolute value of a, a sub n plus 1, that is just some particular uh, term in the sequence when n is n plus 1. So this guy is a constant, right? And this out here is called the tail of the series, right, a lot of times. We just talk about um, this is the tail of the series. You probably can't read that, um, but you can hear it. Uh, and so what happened before, right, what happened before, before there were, you know, here's n minus one, and here's one, and here's two, and you know, I mean, this piece up here is finite. If we're adding together finitely many terms, well then the sum is finite, right? Okay, if we're adding together finitely many, like real numbers, the sum is finite. So really what happened at the beginning, while well, it changes the actual sum, it doesn't change whether you have convergence or divergence. Convergence or divergence depends only on what the tail of the series does. We talked about that a little bit before, here is where it really comes to play in this proof, okay? So we're looking at all of this. Um, let's just do one more. What if little n was n plus four? You guys tell me without us going through the whole thing. A sub capital N plus five then would be less than, you guys tell me, can you tell me what it would be, right? So what do we have, right? When it's four, we have three. When it's three, we have two. When it's two, we have one, right? So you guys tell me, what should this be? When it's five, this ought to be, right, one less, r to the fourth times what? The absolute value of a sub n plus one, a constant, yeah? Okay. So, where are we going with this, okay? Well, what is this, right? This is just a series, okay? Um, if we add up all of these guys, right? If we add up all of these guys, um, if we consider, right, the series where we're adding up all of these guys, so a sub n plus, let's say, k, from k equals two to infinity, yeah? Um, and we also consider absolute value. And we also consider if we added up all of these guys, right? Well, what would that be? A series of what? Well, what do we have? Um, r to the k minus 1 times the absolute value of a sub n plus 1 if we start counting k at 2 and go to infinity, right? Yeah, because when k is 2, we get r to the 1 times this, right? So then plus, if we added that piece, when r is 3, r squared times that, right? Okay, and keep on going. Yeah, that makes sense? Okay, so um, if we're considering these series and we wanted to try to, to think about what we might need in order to talk about this is the tail, right? This is the tail of our series. Got a little carried away. We need to put in our, our generic term, okay? So um, what if we continue this idea and um, so we're going to consider these two series and so we need to think about their generic terms if we're going to actually try to maybe use the, ooh, maybe you're thinking about it, the comparison test to compare since each term, right, seems to be smaller, all right? And so let's think about, um, so we're going to think about these two series. These are the tail of the series we're interested in, right? That guy converges, our original series converges, okay? Absolutely. Um, 
And that ought to be looking a little familiar. I'll let you think about it for a sec. What is that kind of a series? Um, so let's come down to here, right? If we continued this process, what is, what is this going to give us? This suggests that if I look at a sub n plus k, that's going to be less than r to the k minus 1 times the absolute value of a sub n plus 1, right? That guy is a constant in general for k greater than or equal to 2. Yeah? Okay, so this inequality we have, we already alluded to the fact that we think we want to use the comparison theorem. Comparison theorem says everything has to be positive. Is this guy positive? Oh, oh it sure is because it's absolute value, right? Yeah. All right, so we have an inequality now. Is this inequality a legit inequality for our comparison theorem? Absolutely. If we want to conclude that this guy converges, then we need to be able to conclude, um, sorry, if we want to conclude that this series converges, then we need to be able to conclude this series converges because the terms of this series are all bigger than the terms of that series, right? But what can we say about this? You got it, right? This is a convergent what? I heard it. Geometric series, right? A convergent geometric series um, since what? What's the condition for geometric series to converge? All right? Since our, since here, what do we know? R is between 0 and 1, which we've erased, but we have our little picture here, right? Okay? We know that. Uh, the geometric series converges for values of r in here. This is a multiplying constant. That doesn't change the convergence. And therefore, our uh, comparison theorem says that this is a convergent series. Those terms are bigger than these terms. Therefore, this is a convergent series. Okay? And that's our proof of part one of the ratio test. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's so cool, right? How, you know, geometric series is the very first thing we talked about. And uh, ratio test one of the last tests we'll talk about. And there it all comes together with the comparison theorem. All right, so um, what about the divergence piece? Let's just talk about that real quick. Oh my gosh, how many people are going to call our house today? Um, let's see, was there anything else I wanted to mention before we moved on? I don't think so. Um, Okay. Finally, um, part two. Remember, we already proved part three, right? Proved it by demonstrating two different series with different behaviors when the limit was one. Um, and so, what's the other, not part three, part two. We already proved part three. Okay. Part two, um, we're going to think about the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n, right? And in part 2, what, what do we get, right? That this limit's bigger than 1, right? What do we mean, right? It's either equal to L, a finite number, um, with L bigger than 1, or, right, it goes off to infinity, which is bigger than 1, right? Curve the top bound, okay? Um, so, in either case, right, um, in either case, if we set up the limit statement, um, in either case, if we set up the limit statement, then that suggests that, not suggests, but tells us that as long as, yeah, for little n bigger than capital N, that's going to come from this piece, right? Okay. Um, that if I look at a sub capital N plus 1 divided by a sub capital N, if I'm far enough out, right, if I'm in the divergence piece, I would say that that's bigger than capital M, right? Okay? If it was that part, right, that's what the, the limit statement would say, right? For every capital M greater than 0, there exists a capital N greater than 0, such that if 
little n is bigger than capital N. This thing is bigger than M, right? Um, so we would have that and M is a big number. And, or if we're going to L and L is positive, then or it's bigger than one, then this expression is gonna be bigger than one. And we can get that uh, same kind of idea, right, from our, if we're out here at N and we went to an L, right? Um, and then this time we would have our uh, one below L and we could always put our L minus epsilon there, okay? Yeah, okay. So that's kind of the idea is that there's always a number here, right? So, uh, you know, this would be like your R again, would be in there. So this is our deal, right? If we're in this case um, where that limit is either a number bigger than one or goes off to infinity, as long as you're far enough out, this ratio is gonna be bigger than one. And if that ratio is bigger than one, then what does that also say, right? Well, that says that the absolute value of an plus one is greater than the absolute value of an. Yeah, okay, right? Fraction math, it's absolute values. So the next term in absolute value is greater than the previous term in absolute value, right? What does that mean about the sequence of terms? Yeah, right, so this is like increasing, right? These guys are increasing, they're getting bigger. Yeah, um, and, um, These guys are getting bigger, and what else, right? They're positive. And so therefore, the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth term of our sequence, if we're in this case, is not gonna be zero. These guys are increasing, and they're positive, right? So the limit is not going to zero as n goes to infinity. And if the limit is not going to zero, what do you know? That's it. The divergence test implies divergence. Yeah, makes sense? Okay, so there we have it. The root test is very similar. That's your homework problem, the root test, um, except the root test is actually slightly easier to prove the other piece. Um, the convergence piece because you don't need a geometric series argument in order to set up the um, type of inequality that you need in order to make the conclusion that you want to be able to make in order to claim that um, in order to claim convergence in the first case of the root test. So I'll let you just have fun with that. And that will bring us to a close. See you later this week with uh, new sections and new interesting cool material. Bye-bye. <laughs>